welcome to when TLS hacks you. Josh, thanks so much for joining us today for Q&A. And I was wondering if you would mind introducing yourself to everyone. Hi, I'm Josh. Uh, I work at uh, Lada Cora. Um, and uh, yeah, this is my second Black Hat talk, uh, which you'll see in a second. Um, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks for being here. Yeah, we were talking a little bit earlier about what inspired you to kind of get into this and you know write about it. I was wondering if you might be willing to share with everyone. Oh yeah, so it was last year with uh, uh, with Apple Pay. Um, we discovered a lot of SSRF vulnerabilities and we're looking into you know different ways of exploiting them when you know there weren't super obvious internal endpoints to hit. Um, so that's what we'll be diving into here. You kind of mentioned uh, Let's Encrypt when we were talking about that. Uh, is that, is oh, that too much yeah. to go into? <laughs> yeah. So during uh, just during exploring this, um, I ended up needing to create a fair amount of SSL certificates. Um, and that's where I was really glad that Let's Encrypt was around just in time for me to start doing this research. Um, just because, uh, you know, anytime I wanted to create a uh, assert I do it free. Um, well, it was really handy. As I see the questions coming in already. All right, the first one was, um, I'm a bit confused about how you go from caching the TLS session ID in memcache to SSRF. Okay. Um, so I guess maybe where the confusion might be is, um, Caching the TLS session ID, um, the TLS session ID gets cached um, on the victim server that I'm attacking with SSRF. So when the victim server uh, makes a first request, it uh, it picks up this TLS session ID. And then when I send the same URL on the next request, it's going to send that session ID to itself. And of course, because it's sending a TLS packet to itself on Mimcraft, it's going to be a bunch of you know, you know, there's going to be a lot of binary data in with it, um, as well as a memcached insert. And because memcached is so permissive, um, it will actually uh, allow, uh, it'll actually parse that memcached insert as long as it's delimited with new lines, even though it's sandwiched between a bunch of binary data. Can you go just a little bit further on this? Because it seems to be an area that people are curious about. Um, because the next question is, how did you get the vulnerable server to use TLS session ID ticket as a body of the SMTP request? Right. Um, so the maybe maybe it helps to step back and um, uh, kind of revisit the just kind of the SRF trigger for this. Um, is that you know, say for a practical example, um, let's see, say you're you know want GitHub to notify you, um, you know, usually it'd be on a Slack channel or something like that, but GitHub to notify you of uh, commits to your repo. So GitHub provides a URL field um, that you can say, like, anytime someone commits to my repo, uh, post to this URL. Um, so with SSRF, people have, um, people have discovered that, you know, if you can enter a URL on a website hits it, that that's, that can be dangerous. Um, so, and where this gets to, you know, actually persisting stuff on GitHub, in this example, um, even though I haven't attacked GitHub, but where it gets to actually persisting stuff on GitHub and getting GitHub to send what it persisted to itself is um, it's, it's where I send one request, GitHub uh, follows a redirect on that request several times, and then um, after your redirects, the DNS entry has expired, and uh, you know GitHub posts the session ID D, which the DNS entry now resolves to itself, um, and onto some local port. Um, that was clear. Uh, let me look back at the question. No problem. I can ask it again if you want. But I know we kind of put you on the question there. Most yeah. of them just about how you're getting whatever, you know, whether it be SMTP or memcache to actually interact or to bring in the SL yeah. oh, Lord, the TLS session ID. 
And actually, something I just realized about this that might be a helpful way to frame it is that this is this is a second order attack, um, and that you know if you're familiar with or want to dig deeper, um, and when watching can look up uh, second order uh, the SQL injection attacks, um, which are kind of the same sort of thing where you like send you know one attack uh, to you know get the server into some state to where you can send a, the same URL or a different URL again and then actually get the attack to happen based upon that second, uh, just the second thing that you launch. Cool. So but that's a, maybe a more, oh, sorry. Uh, you're, you're doing great. Um, so we, we can also ask Nate Brady's question from the, uh, sure. from the Discord. He wants to know, he said, you mentioned in your talk that MySQL and Postgres might be susceptible services. What's behind that? And when looking at other services, what are the main things to look for? Oh, right. That's a good question. Um, so th this is actually where I'm really curious to see other people take this further. Um, is that, you know, what I have here is the ability to get a server to send, you know, with a really flexible manner, uh, binary data to itself that I control, right? Um, the, now, the difficulty with uh, with attacking uh, stuff like MySQL and Postgres is that they're binary protocols. And, you know, a lot of times, it, at least as far as I've seen, a valid TLS packet is not going to be, uh, it's not going to function as a valid MySQL, uh, you know, insert, or, you know, something that's going to trigger an insert but the area where I'm really curious is to see if anyone could go with, could do some like memory corruption or, you know, other areas that I'm, I'm definitely not that great at like memory corruption vulnerabilities, but I'm really, really curious to see if people can actually take this and run that direction. Cool. I'll see. Point, go ahead. Oh, was, on that point, is there a list of, you know, prerequisite conditions for this to attack to be successful? Um, the big, uh, so I guess the, the big point there is, uh, probably the most helpful thing is the, there's a triple Venn diagram I have maybe, I feel like it's two thirds of the way through the talk. Um, and I believe the slides are posted. Um, but it's the three of those together are effectively the prerequisite. So you need to have a, uh, something that looks like SSRF. Um, sometimes in the case of like the Chrome demo or I'm phishing people, it's actually CSRF, but in, in that case, it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit weird, but just restricting to SSRF, you know, you need to be able to send a server a URL and it needs to hit that URL. Um, you actually, with these, um, it's flexible enough that you don't care about like, you know, content type restrictions. You don't care if server only accepts PNGs, stuff like that. You just need some, you, you need that precondition. You also need whatever the server is using to send the URL to be something that caches TLS sessions. Um, so, like, I don't believe like Python currently caches TLS sessions, um, and I mean there are other. I think Go, most Go stuff doesn't cache TLS sessions either, or at least yeah, I think there's an open ticket in Go to actually do this. At which point you will be able to attack Go stuff. Um, but. Uh, and then the third one um, is that whatever you're attacking has to have some locally an authenticated service. And so the reason I pick on memcached particularly a lot is just that um, it's so common to be to have memcached sitting on a server locally unauthenticated. Um, so, uh, but there's let's see, there's there's also there, there's like a table in the talk. And I'd actually, I'd also be curious to see what locally unauthenticated services, you know, people are uh, using to do SRF attacks. Awesome. Yeah, I, I remember in your talk, I think you had a slide on a whole bunch of the different uh, SSRF examples, and I, you might have even had them uh, ranked. I think the, the the memcache one, you had like RCE next to it, all the way down to some others. And there's often only just like so much room that you can put on there. Are there like... Do you think there's a lot more vectors or areas that would be vulnerable to this type of attack uh, that other people might potentially be able to find? 
I, I do think so. Um, and actually, one thing that I that I thought about exploring, I really wanted to get like a demo like this in time for <laughs> the presentation. Would be uh, uh, finding some webcam that has like a telnet port open, right? Which that has happened in the past. Um, and then you know having the fishing demo, then get like a shell on that webcam or something like that. Um, the catch with that is that I couldn't find any webcams right now that have like that bad of a vulnerability. Um, probably just, I mean, there probably are, but I haven't had the time to, um, to order them all and <laughs> explore them. <laughs> and we have the next question, which is you mentioned that using Mozilla within the right parameters instead of Chrome would be preferable to protect you. What was Chrome's reason for not addressing this? Um, so I think, let's see, I think really, it, it, it seems to boil down to severity. Um, yeah, I don't want to gossip too much about Chrome here, but, um, they, uh, I think, and to some extent, um, Chrome also has other DNS or binding approaches. Um, so for example, you know, if you're phishing someone and you can get them to click a link, right? Um, that in that case, if you can get something to load a, someone to load a fully malicious page, um, I think there are still existing DNS or binding approaches. Um, I think, you know, whereas here for, for Chrome specifically, I'm just adding the ability to, um, if someone's viewing an email and doesn't click a link, um, then you know I can still attack them by using TLS and image tags. Um, and actually, I don't know if I got into it in this talk, but the the reason Mozilla is actually so Mozilla allows you to disable TLS session IDs. Um, Mozilla has kind of a quirk where it caches by IP address instead of domain, which is it's kind of, in a way, it's a bug, but I don't think it's really a serious one. Um, like, it's not consistent with the implementation, but it actually makes Mozilla safer, or Firefox safer by default against this stuff. Um, so how was your experience with reporting the vulnerabilities that you found? What kind of uh, feedback did you get? Was it a good experience, bad experience, mixed all across the board? How was that? I'd say it was kind of mixed, especially at, at first. Um, but I, I think what kind of helped with that is kind of reframing this as, you know, this really like when you report this stuff like Chrome or like Curl or someone that's like, you know, even though it's like that software that's making the vulnerability happen, right? It is ultimately like this is just kind of a consequence of the way TLS, you know, is standardized, right? Um, and so, you know, even though there definitely are potential fixes, you know, like, I think I can definitely understand why people are not rushing to try to, like, di diverge from the spec in order to, like, address this particular attack. Um, cool. Okay. Way on the DNS side to be able to protect yourself from this? Uh, yes. Um... So there's an there's an interesting um, like in the past there have been you know of course like DNS or binding attacks as a whole are not new. Um, the only thing that's new here is DNS or binding with TLS, right? Um, so uh, in the past, just by just in order to address DNS uh, or binding over like HTTP, um, I believe like PFSense. And like, I think there's like a plugin for, uh, for like, if you have a Raspberry Pi, like Pi hole, um, or I, I think it might be built into like DNS mask and stuff, um, to where if they, I think if they like sense, a, a, a domain name getting resolved to something publicly, and then later it's getting resolved to like localhost, um, these plugins will detect that and you know, I think either like block it or just, you know, do something to protect you from it. So I do think those would also protect from the TLS variant of this. 
Although the caveat with that is that even though that's something you could theoretically roll out on like every network, I don't think it's, I think there are some like instances where it would be a breaking change on a network. So it's a little bit complicated to roll out in that respect. Excellent. Uh, Nate Brady wants to know, when you have a second order blind SSRF attack like this, how do you know if you've successfully poisoned something like memcached and when would you report it? Um, so yeah, this is actually, this is one, one area where it gets difficult is, mm-hmm. um, you know, a, a lot of the stuff I've, I've really mainly focused on open source stuff. Um, you know, so in that case, it's like I can prove out locally the whether I've inserted something into memcached, and then you know just report it. It's like here's the steps to reproduce. It does get more difficult if you don't have that level of transparency onto something you're attacking. Um, I think the way that I've you know kind of I've had a few attempts at this um, is to first you know port scan, right? Or like first, you know, you can do like internal port scanning in virus strap and lots of people do that. And it's not a super serious vulnerability, right? Um, aside from, you know, launching on other things. So some people, what they do is, you know, what you could do is you could port scan by SRF, discover that port 1121 or like 295, that something like that is like open. Um, and then what I've thought about doing is just like, you know, if I if I see that right, you know, I can trigger an insert, right, and say like, "Hi, this is Josh in their memcache," right, and then submit it, and it would be like, you know, if you see the entry in your memcache, then you know this is really bad. Um, you could also try to just spray like Python deserialization payloads, like because um, you know just because of how big TLS session tickets can be, you could put like you know, hundreds or thousands of payloads in there and just hope that one of them will, one of them will like get deserialized and execute. Um, and then, you know, another way is, I don't know if I'd recommend this necessarily, but is just trying the DDoS, or not DDoS, but just like denial of service angle, where memcache does have a flush all command. So if you were to try this attack and get memcache to flush all, and suddenly you see the site like, you know, starting to take one time to load pages, then, uh, you know, that's one way you could have evidence that this is actually happening against Memcache. It seems like you're still delving into this and, you know, learning more, but we're being asked is, are you working on this type of attack with anything else? For example, you know, cross-site forgery request, or sorry, I said that one wrong, <laughs> uh, cross-site request forgery. Right. Um, so the, I, th- I think the thing with CSRF, um, well, specifically with TLS for mining, right, is uh, the, um, you know, really it kind of, it's something that practically you, you want to send from like, or, you know, you want to send from like a phishing URL, right? Um, and because kind of the, really in most cases, the where this happens is just Chrome and where it can be printed as Chrome, right? Um, there's not a whole lot of depth to go with, go here with just CSRF attacks. Um, although, um, in a way, like another avenue of exploiting this within Chrome is to do uh, is to if you have an excess in like a PDF generator, um, like there was a talk last year at uh, I think DEF CON um, uh, about. Uh, about PDF generators getting like access to RC in those. Um, and that's kind of a CSRF angle, even though it's on a server, it's like Chrome. Um, so that's, that is one angle is like, if you have a PDF renderer that's running, you know, and it can access like a memcache instance or like a mail instance or something like that. Um, that's, that's kind of a CSRF attack that you could explore. Cool. Um... I think you mentioned before that last year at DEF CON you presented on SSRF and then this year you have this presentation. Where do you think that you're going to go from here? What's next 
for you. I'm guessing you probably already have some ideas of things that you want to look into. Is there some kind of next thing in this area, or are you going in a completely different direction next? Um, oh, man. Let's see. I have different directions. Um, let's see. Or also, are there other things based on what you found that you want other people to look into that you figured, I didn't quite get a chance to go as far as I wanted to with this yet, and if somebody else is interested, they could kind of jump onto your work as well. Right, right. I'm trying to figure out how, how much I want to delve into detail on. Sure. Don't want to reveal too much. Um, there. <laughs> but actually, the, the second part of that question I like, because there's, there's definitely here where, stuff here where I've kind of like been like, okay, this is I've been spent so much time trying to like DNS or bind or TLS or bind stuff that um, I don't want to delve too deeply. And I, you know, I just kind of, to some extent, I look forward to like seeing people find and write up further vulnerabilities in this space. Um, so definitely like, you know, stuff where you're targeting something with memory corruption payloads, that would be really interesting to see this like chain with that. Um, cause in the past, like, uh, I think an orange size talk in like 2017, a new era of SRF, right. Um, he had some really interesting vulnerability chains with SRF there. So doing something, you know, now that we can effectively have, you know, HTTPS URLs that act as go for payloads, right. You know, we can kind of like revive that line of research in a, a bit. Um, and then also like, um, so there are a lot of SRF vulnerabilities out there that, you know, have been reported and written up, right, and been, you know, like at least assumed to be fixed. Um, but I think also like some of this research, I found that in, in some cases it actually invalidates that assumption that something's been fixed because sometimes people will fix something by just, you know, checking if the URL is HTTPS um, and leaving the fix there, whereas, here you can actually go back and unfix those vulnerabilities. Question earlier about what was your motivation with getting into this? And I was looking over your GitHub and I think I see a lot of you know interesting things that go a little bit deeper into this with more information. Would you be willing to talk to us a little bit about what you have on there? Um let's see. I'm trying to think what's on my GitHub. Uh, putting you on the spot there. <laughs> what? I said, we're really putting you on the spot today. Oh, yeah. Um, Specifically about your TLS poison repo. Oh, right. Yes, the, the TLS poison repo. Um, let's see. I posted um, the link if people want to take a look. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, the link's right there. And, and definitely, like, as people are going through these instructions, um, I've already had a couple of people re reach out with some really good feedback on, on um, these instructions. Because it's definitely like, it's just a fair warning on setting this up. It's it, it, The instruction can be a little bit tough to work through just because you have to set up a couple of instances and DNS entries and a TLS certificate. Um, so like if you're really familiar with like infrastructure setup, then it might be a bit of a breeze. But I mean, otherwise it can be a learning experience. Um, but I definitely we wrote these instructions up pretty hastily. So there's some rough edges. Cool. Also along the lines of uh, a learning experience, one question that I've been asking a few of the other speakers that have been doing research, uh, how do you get started? Like if you're somebody that's new and really is interested in getting some kind of uh, research angle, or maybe they want to speak at DEF CON one day. So like, how do I find that next thing? And how do I actually, you know, jump in and find something to research and where do I start? Yeah, um, I think you know, one thing, especially with vulnerabilities, like, you know, there's just like vulnerabilities like these is that, um, you know, just opening up Wireshark, right? And, you know, say there's like some IoT device on your network, um, trying to get Wirestart to like see what the IoT device is doing or just see what some piece of software is doing. Um, or, I mean, honestly, just 
a anytime you can intercept traffic and pick it apart and look what look at what stuff is doing, that's really helpful. Um, I think actually even the first the first discovery of this was um, I'm just remembering is you know it was when I like was doing SRF something and I accidentally like had an HTTP endpoint that I fed like a uh, an HTTPS URL and I was like and I got an error like you know like Flask was saying like a bunch of random characters that that's not a valid request method and I'm like that's an interesting error. So, you know, then, you know, open up Wireshark and just seeing like, oh, what are some fields here I can use? And, you know, of course, previously people use S9 field, um, you know, but, you know, there, there may even be more stuff here. Um, as well as, I mean, you know, just TLS is, you know, really complicated. So um, there's definitely a lot of angles to explore it with. It certainly sounds like there's a lot of research to still be done. And if people kind of wanted to contribute to what you're already working on and you know, start working together, is that something you're looking towards or, you know, a way for them to best do it? Oh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, if anyone has, uh, I mean, has just the time and ability to, to make this repo a little bit easier to set up, whether that's like infrastructure as code or just like, better documentation um, or like, you know, introductory readmes, that's definitely welcome. To the end of the time we have together, besides the GitHub, what is the best way for people to be able to reach out with any other questions or if they hit, you know, issues when they're trying to get this set up on their own? Oh, yeah. Um, so my Twitter, uh, JoshMDX, it's the same as my uh, username on this uh, DEF CON server. Um, and I believe my uh, direct messages are open, at least on Twitter. Uh, you can also send me a friend request or you know, try to reach out on the Discord, too. Thanks for taking the time to answer these questions. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you again next year. It seems like you're on a roll with this subject. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thanks, Josh.